Hey, good morning once again, options traders. Well, a theme that I carry in most of my videos is that there is no such thing as a good strategy or a bad strategy. They're just simply tools. And like all types of tools, there are times to use some and times to not use them. And that's really the way you need to approach options as opposed to being on the hunt for the absolute golden strategy that makes all the money in the world and never loses. That's one of the things that I hear from a lot of traders out there. You know, what's the best strategy? But to really make the most of your trading and your decisions, you need to understand the different characteristics. So here's a good question for our group. Which options carry the most information? Now the answer, once we reveal it, is a class of options that you're all familiar with, but this is going to be cast in a light that you've probably never seen before. And by understanding this aspect of options, it will help you to make better decisions. So let's go find out this whole idea of which options carry the most information. And before we do, please be sure to click like and subscribe. It is greatly appreciated and always helps to promote the channel. So to start off with, we have to understand this idea of certainty. Information only has value if it has the ability to alter a decision. And if something is certain, well, then it carries really no information and therefore no value. Why? Because everybody knows. So if I offered to sell to you some information about whether the sun will rise tomorrow, you'd probably say, thanks, but no thanks. Everybody knows that it will, or at least is about as certain as we can be. So you'd say there's no value in that information because it's close to 100% certainty. Now we could go in the other direction and I could say, well, for a fee, I will tell you if it will or will not rain in the Atacama Desert tomorrow. Well, that's the driest spot on earth and I was reading about it. There are some sections that haven't seen a drop of rain in 500 years. So how much would you pay for that information, whether it will rain or not? in the Atacama Desert? You'd say thanks, but no thanks. So the thing to take from this right now is that if something is 100% certain, it doesn't have value. Again, knowing that the sun will rise tomorrow. Or we could look at it in terms of 0% certainty. So again, we have 0% certainty that it will rain in the Atacama Desert tomorrow. So it has no value. So the thing to see is that 100% certainty and 0% certainty are just simply two sides of the same coin. So let's now talk a little bit about uncertainty. Removing uncertainty has value. What's the maximum uncertainty? 50%. Think of it like a coin flip. That's the worst case of certainty or uncertainty that we can have. That's why it's funny when the weatherman tells you on television that there's a 50% chance of rain today. Well, that really tells you nothing. It's just the maximum uncertainty. If they were worth anything, they should lean a little bit to one direction or the other. Tell me it's 49% or 51%. So 50% is the worst case of uncertainty that you can have. So if you can remove half of the uncertainty, you're maximizing the amount of valuable information. And that's really the trick to understanding about which options convey the most value. So to do a demonstration, let's go back to the game show. I believe it was The Price is Right. So for example, contestants were shown several items. It might be a trip to Tahiti, a Cadillac, and a boat, whatever, and they would have to guess the value of these items, usually to the nearest thousand or maybe the nearest hundred. And the question that we want to explore here is, what's the best strategy for getting to the answer the quickest? And the answer is that you need to remove half of the uncertainty at each stage. So let's just do a simple example and look at one item. It would be the same strategy if we had multiple items, but I went to a Boston Whaler website and looked at a, I think it was a 26 footer, 300 horse engine, different accessories. And they said, this was priced at $145,800. So let's just say that this is the boat that they're shown. And the game show would tell you some of the specifications on the boat to give you kind of a rough idea. So once you had this, you had to guess, let's say to the nearest $100, the value of this boat, and I think you had something like 30 seconds to do it in, but it was on a clock. 
Well, let's take a look at the strategies. Let's start off with the first one of what not to do. What you wouldn't do is say, uh, I don't know, maybe uh, how about 200,000? And the host says, no, that's too high. And you say, uh, how about 198,000? Nope, too high. How about 197,500? Host says, nope, too high. And see what happens here, and every once in a while you would see a contestant that would do that, is they just are certain that their first guess is pretty close. So they're trying to just dance around this value until they can just zoom in on it. But the problem is, is that each guess removes very little uncertainty. To maximize it, we have to try to remove half. So here's what you would want to do. You're either going to guess too low or too high. Put those in quotes because you might not know for sure, but you can get a pretty good idea of something that's definitely too low or too high. And once you get high and low boundaries established, you continue to cut the range in half. And each guess establishes a new high or low, but removes the most uncertainty. And therefore, those are the most valuable guesses. So for instance, here's the price of the boat again, 145.8. Now remember, the contestant obviously doesn't see this. So let's say that we're the contestants here. We guess 400,000. Host says too high. Cut it in half. So we say 200,000. Too high. Cut it in half again. 100,000. Too low. So notice that in just three guesses, we've established a high and a low boundary. So this boundary is now 50,000 wide. Our next guess is to cut it in half. Let's add 50,000 to our low end here and guess 150,000. Host says it's too high. Now I have a new upper limit. I know the boat is between 100,000 and 150,000, a $50,000 range of which 25,000 is the halfway point. So now the next guess is going to be 125,000. And the host says, nope, that's too low. So now I know the boat is between 125 and 150. So now we have a $25,000 range. Now here's where it can get a little tricky. To technically split that, it would be 12,500. But you'd have to be a little careful, especially if you're on the clock, of having to go into halves and quarters and eighths and sixteenths and things like that. So you might just say, well, let's just make it 13,000 difference. So we'll add 13,000 to 125. We'll guess 138. Host says 138 is too low, but now we know the boat is somewhere between 138,000 and 150,000, and that is a $12,000 range. We cut it in half. We add 6,000 to 138, and we guess 144,000. Host says that's too low, but now we have a $6,000 range. So half of 6,000 is 3,000. I add it on to the bottom here, make it 147. So I guess 147,000. Host says that's too high. But now I know it's between 144 and 147. And now at this point, because we're fairly close, we might decide to split this and go at 1,500 and guess 145.5. Host says that's too low. And now again, instead of continuing to split this, we might just say 146. Host says that's too high. But look at this. We now know it's between 145.5 and 146. We're within 500 bucks. And so this is where contestants would say 145.5, 145.6, 145.7, 145.8, and that's when they would hit it. But the point to see is that in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 guesses, we quickly zeroed in on a value that we had really had no idea of what it was. Now, what if we had guessed 800,000? You can see that in just it would have taken one more step to get you down here. So that's why it's important to guess something that's too high. You could also go in the other direction and guess too low and say 50,000. And now you would just double it. Host would say that's too low, 100,000 too low, 200,000 too high, and you're right back at this step. But the idea is that whenever you cut half of the information out, you are making the most valuable guesses and you can get to your target the fastest. Okay, so what does this idea have to do with options? Well, this is really what at-the-money options do. You see, to understand the options market, at least at a more of a philosophical level, the options market tries to resolve which options will be in the money at expiration. So think of it as though there's two lines that are forming, in-the-money options and out-of-the-money options. 
And every day, the market's trying to figure out which of all of these strikes are going to be in the money at expiration and which will be out of the money at expiration. So if we are looking at deep in the money options, we are near certainty. This is like the sun's going to rise tomorrow. People are saying, okay, well, that's not really telling me a whole lot about whether this option's going to expire in the money. I'm pretty sure that it will, so therefore it doesn't have a lot of value. Now, don't confuse that to mean it doesn't have a high price tag. In other words, a total premium. It might have a lot of intrinsic value. But remember, the true option value is the extrinsic value. So a deep in the money option is not going to have a lot of extrinsic value. On the flip side, if we go deep out of the money, we are also near certainty. We're certain that they won't be in the money. This is like saying that we expect rain in the Atacama Desert. We're pretty certain that it won't happen. So the deep in the money and the deep out of the money options are the ones that convey very little information and therefore they have very little value, relatively speaking. But the at the money options are the most uncertain because half of them will expire in the money and half will expire out of the money. And therefore they convey the most information and that means they convey the most value. Now again, remember when we say the most value, it's the highest extrinsic value, not the total value. So let's jump over to an E-Trade platform and see if this is true. Okay, so now we're into the E-Trade platform. I'm going to use the S&P 500 or the Spiders, currently at about 475. So look down here, we've got a expiration with 28 days to go. So the at the monies would be 475 strikes right there. So look at the extrinsic value, that's this column. And we can see that it has, this 475 strike, $6.71 of extrinsic value. But as we move to lower strikes, look what happens. We go 650, 602, 572, 547. The extrinsic value is being reduced. Why? As we go to lower strikes, like the 471 strike, we are getting less and less information about whether it's going to be in the money or not. We're relatively certain that it will be. So therefore, we're not willing to pay as much for the option. Again, when we say as much, we mean the extrinsic value. Now, if we go in the other direction, here's the 475 strike. If we go to the 476, look at that. It drops from 671 to 635. And then next step down, 576, 525, 463, 419. They're getting progressively cheaper. And that's because these also don't carry a lot of information. We're pretty certain that they're going to expire out of the money. But the 475 strike, who knows? That's a coin flip. And so it conveys the most information and conveys the highest price tag. Because if you buy this call, or if you buy this put, you are removing half of all of the stock prices in the future. It's either going to be above that or below it. And again, that's why the market is commanding the highest price. Now, what you're going to see is that no matter which underlying you choose or expiration, that will always be true. So let's jump over to NVIDIA. So let's go to this one here with 357 days to expiration. NVIDIA is really close to 499. Now, these strikes are in $10 increments. So we can see that the extrinsic value for the 490 is about $88.20. And then for 500 is $91.65. And then the 505 strike drops to $88.66. So the 500 strike has the highest extrinsic value. The market is pricing that one as the at the money. As we move to lower strikes, extrinsic value drops. As we move to higher strikes, the extrinsic value drops. Why? Because again, we're moving towards certainty. At this end of the range, we are relatively certain it will be in the money, and so the market's not willing to pay as much extrinsic value. At this end of the range, the market is relatively certain it will be out of the money, or that it won't be in the money. And therefore, market participants are not willing to pay as much extrinsic value. But when you're right here in the center, at that 50-50 shot, the option conveys the most information, has the ability to remove half of all of those values, and therefore it commands 
the highest price. So even though the At The Money options convey the most information, that doesn't mean that you always choose them. Remember, they're tools. So don't just randomly buy At The Money puts, let's say, to protect stock positions. Why? Part of the reason is that option premiums usually annualize out to about 20% per year, whereas stock returns are in the order of about 8 to 10% per year. Instead, use At The Money options for the right reasons. So to make the most of options trading and decisions, use at the money options for the times that you feel you need to remove the most uncertainty. And for anyone who'd like to learn more about the arts and science of options trading, please check out the Alpha Trader course, Strategy Lab, and a Candlesticks and Technical Analysis course. It's all at optionsa to z.com. Also, please join us on Options A to Z's Facebook trading group, and you can find a link in the description below.